Good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to share with you our study on the gender disparities in social protection coverage, particularly social, social insurance. So the objectives of our study are to identify, next slide, please, identify gaps in the coverage of social insurance programs, namely social security system, government service insurance system, and the national health insurance or field health. We also wanted to examine the characteristics and circumstances of men and women without access to social protection who also belong to the poorest 30 percent of the households. So we are focusing on the situation of people who are highly vulnerable uh, to risks. We also wanted to examine factors associated with um, access to social insurance in a more formal way um, in our regression analysis. And all these uh, are meant to provide or, or for purposes of, of getting insights um, for program and policy design in improving social protection coverage. Next, please. Okay, so what, just to mention the rationale for the study, people are exposed to different risks, unemployment, um, other income shocks, illnesses, disability, and recently the COVID-19 pandemic. And the Philippines is also highly vulnerable to natural calamities and climate change and weather variability. Some, of, um, some are more capable of managing these risks, getting themselves protected. Others are, are less capable. But many are highly vulnerable, particularly the poor. Hence, there is a need to examine coverage of social protection programs. And our focus in this report are gender disparities in the, the coverage of these uh, programs. Please note that we also um, limited our analysis to social insurance coverage um, on membership in the insurance schemes that we that we have that I have mentioned a while ago. So why gender disparities? Um, previous work noted the disadvantaged position of women relative to men. Many of them are not in the labor force, as mentioned a while ago by our president. And because of this, many are not formally employed, which is the usual and relatively more sustainable channel uh, for obtaining social insurance and other benefits. And um, we know from literature that helping women is associated with holistic development when women are empowered, when they are provided benefits, um, when, they're, when they're protected, they're more likely to invest in proper nutrition, education, and healthcare for their children. Meanwhile, men, particularly in the Philippines uh, social context, are traditionally the breadwinners um, and heads of the family because social norms dictate that women do most of the care work um, at home. The family relies heavily uh, on the male head to provide for the family. It is therefore very important to understand both their circumstances and develop insights for improving um, their situation as far as social insurance is concerned. Next, please. Next slide, please. So um, this is basically a descriptive analysis with some correlational analysis, as I've mentioned a while ago. And circumstances of men and women using the merged data of the labor force survey and the annual poverty indicator survey. And we segregated the analysis into employed persons and, the, and those not in the labor force, including youth um, not in employment and education. And as I've mentioned earlier, we, we conducted more formal uh, regression analysis for, for the correlates of social insurance membership. Please. Okay, so I am a graph here titled composition of non-members non-members meaning that they don't have sss or gsi gsis and field health whether whether it's a paying scheme or the the sponsored scheme so i'm showing the the composition of non-members by employment status um the employed unemployed and not in the labor force i would just like to describe um the graphs more uh, for the benefit of our audience who may have um, visual uh, impairment. So what is shown in this graph um, are the compositions of persons who do not have the, the membership. And I'm, I'm illustrating through this graph that we need to examine more deeply the employed persons and those not in the labor force because these two comprise the bulk of non-members. So 
male workers, we estimated that there is at least 10.6 million employed men who are non-members. When I say non-members, they do not have both um, schemes. They're not members of, of both schemes. So apart from the 10.6 million male workers, there are 1.1 million men who were not in the labor force and some 800,000 who were unemployed. For the women, we estimated that there were at least, um, and this is for 2017 data, or 2017 estimates, there were um, 6.4 million employed and another 6.7 million not in the labor force and around half a million unemployed who are non-members. So you can see the two big groups um, are employed and the not in the labor force because um, the unemployed takes a, a small proportion. In total, there were at least 26 million persons age 15 to 59 who are non-members. And this represents 56% of the population of interest. Note that this figure does not include the segment of, in, of economically inactive persons who were currently in school. So we, we did not include those. So the graph shows that 65% of all non-members are employed, were employed, while 30% were not in the labor force. In terms of composition by sex, majority or 52% of the non-members were women. Note that for men, the bulk of non-members were employed, while that for women comprised of employed and those not in the labor force. Next, please. We now move to the analysis of the employed person's um, circumstances. Next, please. Next slide. Okay, so we are showing you in this graph the composition of workers by class, regardless of their membership or, or access to social insurance, so that we have first an, an understanding of the general composition of workers. It is important to, to have, that, have this in mind as we go to the other results later on. So the way to read this graph is that among employed women, you can see the, the, the bar on the, on the top um, part of the graph, 43.6 or 44% or of them work in private establishments. In contrast, 63% of male workers work in the private establishments. Next, please. Next this slide, please. Can, can we show the next slide? Thank you. Okay, so this next graph shows the composition of employed who are non-members. Sorry, I'm not seeing, um, yeah, okay, thank you. So the way to read this, this graph is that among employed women who are non-members, one third worked in the private establishments, another one third were self-employed and nearly 15% were unpaid family workers and around 12% were household workers. So this is composition. You take all the, the female uh, non-members who are employed and you take the, the percentage of each class of worker. So we can see here that there is disproportionately higher percentage of women, non-members who are self-employed. Remember that on the overall, only 24% women were self-employed. This, this is also the case for unpaid family workers and household workers. Among men who are non-members, on the other hand, 58.3% were in the private, uh, were workers in private establishments and some 23% were self-employed during that time and 6.9 or 7% were unpaid family workers. Again, there are more self-employed men who are non-members than we expected given the composition of male workers in general. So this information enables us to form questions in our minds um, on what is going on with the self-employed. At the same time, it gives us the, class, the classes of workers that require greater focus and these are private establishment workers and self-employed uh, um, persons for both men and women, and also the categories of unpaid workers, household workers. Next, please. 
next graph a uh, next slide please the way to read this uh, next graph is that thank you okay so this graph um put here employed non-members in bottom 30 percent so in this graph we would like to show you that um among um the employed non-members who are living um or in households that are part of bottom 30 percent um what is the percentage of those workers in private households that like that that belong in this category for instance um the blue or the purple bars here um, pertain to male workers and then the blue bars pertain to female workers so among male private household workers 37 percent are not members and belonging to the bottom 30 percent this is 43 percent for women and and so on and we can see that save for household workers there are relatively more men than women who are in this difficult situation of being non-member and at the same time part of the poorest 30% uh, of, of households in the country. If we look at the biggest groups, private establishment workers and then the self-employed, men are worse off than women. This is also true for the other categories except among government workers where there is relatively um, the same proportion who are in this condition. Next, please. We now look at the circumstances of workers in greater details. Next slide, please. Okay, so this graph showed the proportion of men and women workers in private establishments who fall under these categories, a permanent job, a short-term, paid on daily basis, and so on. So we can see um, the, the pairs of bars, they're actually separated from each other because uh, we cannot we should not add this not these do not add up into like 100% or, or or something like that we just wanted to show the difference between men and women in these categories but um let me point out that um the workers in this uh, class of work um and are facing this uh, difficult situation eight out of ten of them are in fact men as for the characteristics both groups, that is men and women, reported that many of them, nearly 70, uh, yeah, okay, thank you, nearly 70% are paid on a daily basis. Half noted their jobs are permanent, though. Slightly more women than men are on short-term job arrangements. There are two times more men than women who want more hours of work, and it is not worthy that more men have other jobs and that they are getting paid more than women next please for the self-employed we learned that men were usually in the agricultural sector while the women are in small retail businesses um, like the sari sari stores and personal uh, services like um, the the manicurists um, um, those working in salons and the spa again we can see here that more men have um, other occupation trying to augment their livelihood and this intention is also evident as more men want more hours, hours of work. And although we cannot um, make uh, the comparison in this graph, um, self-employed women wanted more uh, work, wanted more hours of work than other categories of female workers, um, which suggests that they want to augment their earnings. Next, please. About unpaid uh, workers, okay. 80 to 88 percent of them are engaged in agricultural activities with um, the overwhelming proportion um, with overwhelming proportion of them working as crop farm laborers in fact 75 percent of men unpaid family workers and 69 percent of women unpaid family workers who are without social insurance membership and living in poorest households are crop farm laborers for men, half of their um, household income on the average come from agriculture, which indicates the seasonality of their farming activities because they, they get some income from non-agricultural activities. And um, perhaps they, they also work as laborers in construction and other elementary occupations of season. Interestingly, nine out of 10 male unpaid workers are single and young. In fact, the average age is 23 and only 27% of women are, are single, and they're way older also, but, uh, with an average um, age of five. 
Next, please. So this graph shows the government workers. So among government workers, when I say government workers, I don't um, just limit it to all the, the regular uh, government workers. It's actually workers for the government. This include the voluntary health workers, um, the janitors, the, the street sweepers. So there are slightly more women who reported that they hold permanent jobs, but despite these, the bulk are paid with commission. As you can see on the left, um, left bars there, the commission-based um, workers. So 40% of male government workers uh, in the category that we've mentioned, those who are non-members and in, in poorest uh, families. So 40% of them are paid um, commissions. And there are relatively more women in that uh, part, in that category, 59% of women are paid um, commissions rather than um, on a monthly basis. We also found that a non-negligible non percentage are um, with other jobs. So even among government workers, the issue seems to be the nature of the employment as well as inadequate earnings, as suggested by their, their profiles. Next, please. So government workers, the male government workers um, who worked um, who are not covered by, by GSIS and other and SSS and field health, they comprise of cleaners, security personnel and protectives, uh, those that are conducting protective services, garbage collectors, um, sweepers, um, building caretakers, and even um, legislate the, uh, the kagawads um, in the local governments. Women in this category comprise of community health workers, healthcare assistants, social work assistants, street sweepers, cleaners, um, clerical workers in the barangays, the daycare workers, the primary, um, secondary school teachers, and teacher aides. So when I'm, I'm, I'm saying this um, kinds of workers, we just zoom in into those uh, workers, uh, government workers who are non-members and um, are part of the poorest families. And we found this, this kinds of, of occupations that they're doing. We now move to the private household workers. Okay, so this graph shows the situation of private household workers. So nearly nine out of 10 workers under this category are women. And there is not much uh, difference in the characteristics between men and women, only that most women in, in this group are married. Um, you'll, you'll find that only 27% are, are single. In contrast, majority of men in this group are single. Um, 59% of them. Although the percentages are small, we can see that having different employers um, is more likely among women than men. You can see here um, the, the percentage of workers with different employers, 4% for, for men and 11% for women. Again, although I have to say that their work um, is considered permanent um, for the, the definition of the labor force survey, majority um, of men and 41% of women, um, although this, this part here are not shown in this graph, they reported that they are paid on a daily basis. Okay, next please. Okay, so as I've mentioned earlier, we also did some correlational analysis between social insurance membership and various socioeconomic factors. Again, using um, the, the pooled um, 2016 and 2017 annual poverty indicator survey with their LFS uh, variables. Note that um, in our dependent variable in the lo logit regression that we did um, is whether or not one is a member in, in SSS or GSIS and field health, but only the paying scheme. We did not include the sponsored scheme here because what we wanted to capture is more about people's ability to pay um, for their contribution. So we found the following um, results, findings. Women are less likely to be covered by social insurance than men, controlling for, for other factors like human capital, economic condition, sector of work, um, even importance of remittances in the families and agricultural income share. And you also found that education is a key factor in having social insurance with likelihood increasing by the number of years a person is educated. Formal employment, um, which we 
um, very arbitrarily defined as working in the private establishment or the government also greatly increases the likelihood of having social insurance. We also found that the level of income positively correlates um, with being enrolled in both uh, social insurance programs as expected. And we found something interesting that warrants um, further analysis, and that is the likelihood um, that the household member is enrolled in social insurance program inversely correlates with the share of overseas remittances the household receives as a share of total income. So for our providers, we need to encourage more of these households to become members. And um, I think um, this has been found in other studies wherein remittances act as, as an insurance. And so maybe this, um, this finding is showing that. So those who are more reliant or who rely more on, insure, on, on remittances in their total income, they are less likely to be enrolled in our social insurance programs. That's what uh, our study um, is pointing out. Moving on to the other correlates. Next, please. Okay, so households that have higher share of, agri of agricultural income to total income are also less likely to be covered by social insurance programs. And, and this fi finding contributes to the notion that most agricultural households in the country are um, informally employed and or have um, limited means for availing um, social insurance. So in the model we, we created, uh, because um, agriculture is so important, um, we created an interaction term for being a woman and the share of agricultural income to total income, because we simply want to know whether women in agriculture have statistically lower probability of being covered by these insurance schemes. And we found that women in households that rely more on agriculture do not have statistically different likelihood um, of accessing social insurance um, from others as shown by the insignificant coefficient in the interaction term. And this is probably because um, women in general, including those who work in informal businesses, in, in private households, tend to be left out. So not just women in the agricultural sector. Furthermore, it is not only the women in the agricultural sector who are less likely to to access social insurance, but but also the men, which is shown in our um, descriptive analysis, particularly among um, unpaid workers in family-operated farms, businesses, and self-employed farmers. Next, please. Now we go to the analysis of characteristics uh, of people not in the labor force. Next, please. Next slide, please. Okay, so this graph um, shows the, la the labor force participation rate of men and women through the years. And you, you may have seen this many times, but this is a very important graph. You see, majority of women aged 15 to 59 are not in the labor force. And there's a very wide gap between male and female labor force uh, participation, nearly, nearly 30 percentage points. In 2018, um, the LFPR among women was 46.7. Um, this is based on, on data from the, the PSA, basic data from the PSA. Um, and that of men is 75.3. To compare this with our neighbors, uh, neighboring countries, the female, the female LFPR um, in 2018 for Singapore is 61%. Um, in Vietnam, it's 72.7. That's for 2019. And Indonesia, although it has lower um, LFPR um, compared to these countries I've mentioned, they still have a bit higher um, than ours at 53%. Next, please. Next slide, please. Okay, so using the data in our study, we tried to profile men and women who are not in the labor force with respect to their individual and household characteristics. And we found that Majority of men um, are single or were single, while majority of women not in the labor force were married, but these women um, have worked at any time prior um, to their situation, which um, reflects, again, the circumstances of women being home-based, doing household work, care work, and traditional roles. We also found that women were living in families that have relatively um, lower per capita income than their male counterpart. So these women not in the labor force, many of them um, 
were in the difficult situation. Um, these, they are not dependents of, of, of families um, doing nothing. Many of them had prior work experience, as I've mentioned, and, and I argue that uh, they may have been stalled um, by their traditional roles um, in the family, and many of them are, are highly vulnerable to risks and shocks, uh, indeed. Next, please. In this graph, um, I'd like to show you um, the youth not in employment and education. It should be NEET, N-E-E-T, uh, not in employment, um, education, or training, but we don't have um, a data or a variable for training in the, the data that we are, are using. So the knee youth, um, they, are, they are neither working nor in school. So we define here youth as those aged 15 to 24. And it is very important that we look at this in our effort to, to more broadly understand access to social protection because there may be a historical aspect in terms of the lives of, of individuals that we can learn from that will help us understand more about their economic inactiveness. So for many women, being inactive starts early. You can see from this graph, the rate of being knee among girls is nearly twice that of boys. It's, it's mirroring the, the LFPR. So in 2017, 28.5% of girls in our, category, in our category, while only 15.2% of boys are considered me or not in employment um, or education. In education, so they're neither in school, they're, they're not working. Now, um, later I have a hypothesis about this low NEE -E -E rate among boys. A low rate is ideal, but we need to know what kinds of work these young men are probably doing and how um, this is connected to their access to social insurance. Next, please. Next, okay, so, so the knee rate has two elements in it, um, not in school and not in employment. The not in, in employment part is largely being not in the labor force rather than um, unemployment. For the schooling part, we examined reasons for not attending school to better understand what is happening to boys um, and girls. And the most common reason, and this, by the way, um, came from uh, the study of David um, Albert and Bismanis 2018, wherein they show that the most common reason for girls um, for being um, not in school, with 38 of them identifying such reason, is related to marriage or family matters, which reflects um, that early marriage and girls' traditional role in the family limit their ability to develop their skills and talents, and consequently their employability. Marriage um, and fa or family matters is also a reason for 15% of boys, but this is uh, this percentage is not even half that for girls. And um, while employment is also one key reason for girls, 20% um, of them reported this reason. This is the most common reason for boys, where 33% of them um, um, reported that um, they were, it's because of employment that they're not attending school. And um, this reflects uh, boys' engagement in the labor force um, early um, in, their, in their life stage. It, is, it also suggests their inability to continue in, in higher education. And note that a significant proportion of boys, 34%, um, signified lack of interest, which may be due to, to peer influence and relatively poor academic performance, and also because of financial issues um, per uh, the study of David et al. Next, please. We also examined school participation among children. And here we look at the case of four of these families because these are highly uh, vulnerable um, group, groups. So the, the condition of four piece is that parents send their children to school, but our data shows uh, that not all children in four piece um, families attend school. And this is perhaps because the four piece provide cash grants only to a maximum of three children, um, age zero to 18. And it is noteworthy that older children are more likely um, to skip school. Among girls, the school, the school participation rate is almost 100% um, for the younger cohort. Um, but this rate starts to go down among teenagers um, age 16, um, wherein 91% attend. And then this 
further decreases to seven to seventy five percent among the, the those age seventeen, and then further down for those um, age eighteen. Among boys, though, the decrease in school participation rate starts um, earlier, at around thirteen years old, uh, with only ninety four percent of them going to school. At 16, this is lowered um, to 91, then to 80 percent uh, at 17, and then among 18-year-old boys, um, only 66 percent of them uh, attend school. So it, it is likewise uh, important to know what are their, um, what are the reasons of for these children in not attending schools. And, and on the most or the most prevalent reason or the, the most common reason um, is the high cost of education, where some of them uh, seek employment and perhaps to augment uh, their, their income, which reflects the financial concern in, in higher education. So such data on the school participation for peace families, um, for poor peace family children suggest that for peace as a program um, is not able to motivate um, beneficiary families uh, to send all their children to school. And this inability of older children, especially those in, in the poorest families um, to attend school, has adverse implication on their employability and consequently on their access um, to social insurance. I'd, I'd like now to summarize, next please, um, the insights from all this data that we have provided. So women not in the labor force face multiple barriers in exercising their right to employment and in turn their access to social insurance. Most of them are married, which means they have a family to care for, slightly less educated than men in this category, and many live with less educated household heads and in households with lower uh, per capita income. Majority also have a previous uh, work experience. Um, they worked in farming and other agricultural activities. Uh, some were domestic helpers and sales lady or sales clerk in, in their previous um, occupation yet they are unable to continue doing gainful work uh, due to their traditional role in the family. Economic inactiveness starts early for women. The NEE rate among girls is nearly twice that of boys. Uh, in the meantime, or meanwhile, employment and engagement in unpaid family um, or unpaid farm work, on the other hand, seems too early for boys. Next, please. So what is the story um, for girls? Girls drop out because of family matters, or many girls drop out, not all girls, many girls drop out because of family matters like early marriages or engagement in, in home care work, resulting to their inability to participate in income um, earning activities that can allow them to afford social insurance. Though many girls um, tend to stay longer in school, we also found um, that many of them stay longer in school. Their traditional roles in the family tend to prevent them from engaging more actively in the economy after, even after they finish school. So for the boys, um, boys tend to drop out uh, of school earlier than girls. Um, many of these seek employment, um, they land most probably in elementary um, occupations or short term contracts that pay on a daily basis. Um, because they're unable to continue their studies, they get stuck in these kinds of jobs as they grow up. Although formally employed in private establishments, many male workers are without social insurance memberships. Others become unpaid workers in their own family farms or businesses. Um, and these young workers are shown to have one of the highest percentages of non-members in, in, so, in social insurance. So what is the bottom line for women um, workers? Um, employed women's lack of access to social insurance appears to be associated with their lack of capacity to pay for premiums, which is likely the case um, for the self-employed and paid workers in family enterprises and the household workers. And self-employed workers, uh, particularly those in small retail businesses and in personal services, have irregular income streams and are not able to pay off the premium on a regular basis. This problem is also evident and more evident, I think, in case of unpaid family workers. Note that many women, um, as well as men, in this category engage mostly in agriculture, which is um, less productive compared to the other sectors. And although majority of household workers reported that their jobs are permanent, a significant proportion of these are considered short term and they are in paid, they are paid on a daily basis. Moving on, okay, so it is quite challenging to access social insurance with short-term jobs 
or contracts or when the workers are paid um, on a daily basis. So even if the employer co-pays the premium, for instance, there is also the issue of, of changing employers, having different employers at the same time. Ensuring these types or, or, or if not different employers, um, there is a fast turnover, which is uh, the case of, of household workers. Also ensuring these types of workers have access to social insurance perhaps requires um, a different strategy than the employer-employee mandatory contributory system because of the nature of short-term jobs and the fast turnover in, in household workers, for instance. It is noteworthy that despite uh, their lack of, of secure income, women had comparatively lower underemployment rate. And it is um, it, this is understandable and it is likely uh, due to their, you know, they're balancing their time between work and home responsibilities. Um, that is why most of them do not uh, desire additional work. There is also a need to ensure that all employed uh, workers are provided access to social insurance as 48% of women working in private sectors, private establishments, and 44% of government uh, female workers still do not have social insurance. For those working for the government, such as volunteer um, health workers, the short-term and at times coterminous nature um, of their work with the, with the local political landscape may hinder their ability to, to access social protection on, on a regular basis. What is the bottom line for women or for men, or what can you say about their um, about their situation? So, past studies show that relatively men are in a better position in terms of access to social insurance because many of them are employed uh, and many women are not. But are they really in a better position? I'd like to say that they have a different but equally difficult um, situation. They may have crossed that important line into employment, um, the formal kind for many, but many of those who worked in, in private establishments are non-members and their lack of access to, to, to social insurance seems to be largely, largely attributed to their being daily wage and commission earners. Most say that they hold um, permanent jobs. So they are in permanent um, and others in short-term jobs that do not have security of tenure. But not only that, that is just part of the whole uh, scenario. They also have very low basic pay. Men who are in the private establishments belonging to the bottom 30% without social um, insurance membership received on the average um, in 2016, like 260 pesos per day. And very few of them have other income sources. Uh, only 8% have other jobs because they were already working or spending 42 hours a week in their primary occupation. So apart from the nature of employment, it's also about the amount of income that they get uh, from their uh, employment. It is important to investigate um, any barriers in private sector workers of membership in social insurance. Um, any violation of relevant policies concerning social insurance must be investigated. With their likely uh, meager income, self-employed farmers and farm workers are unlikely to prioritize um, membership in social insurance. The high underemployment rate among such um, male workers signifies their need for higher level of income. So on the overall, it appears that um, being employed is not enough. Employment does not guarantee um, access to social insurance for most uh, of the workers in this study. It must um, gainful and income must be secure. In addition, um, this uh, predicament um, seems to start early with boys dropping out of school um, to either seek employment or, or support their family farm or businesses as unpaid family worker probably, of course, because of the, the economic issues um, in their family. Many of these unpaid male workers are young, single, farm laborers, and because farm work is seasonal and earnings are not guaranteed, they are in a very vulnerable uh, situation. Remember a while ago that male youth have a much lower rate of knee, uh, those not in employment and education, than girls. I argue that although that is the case, they are employed in rather elementary occupations. And because their, their level of education is relatively low, remember they, they drop out early, their options are limited and they are unable to obtain high paying jobs or more, more decent um, paying jobs. So during a, a, a farm season, they may take uh, work 
in construction as laborers. So these are the kinds of workers that are in need of social protection. So to summarize the key issues, next slide please, um, for social insurance coverage um, expansion, Lack of income security um, is one of the key um, issues due to the due to the unstable and casual nature of many jobs in private establishments, private households, small um, small businesses, and in agriculture. With unstable income sources, people are not uh, encouraged to enroll and sustain their membership. They may enroll, but they may not be able to to sustain their their um, contributions or they pay their contributions. So. It's a cycle, a lack of income security resulting to inability to access social insurance, um, which is important in times of risk, and that in turn leads to greater uh, vulnerability. And the main issue for unpaid family workers um, and to force the self-employed, uh, it should be inserted here in this um, slide, is that many of them work in agriculture, which is currently less productive compared to other workers, as I've mentioned um, a while ago. This is an evidence that improving agricultural productivity and not only agricultural productivity and also farm opportunities in the rural areas are likely to contribute to the improvement of both women and men's ability to access um, social insurance. There, next please, there may also be lack of enforcement or implementation of the law in providing access to social insurance for workers in private establishments and private households. And for these further studies must be done to examine the barriers in these categories. There may also be lack of awareness and low level of perception about the benefits of social insurance that we need to address. Um, it is also possible that there are administrative hurdles um, in enrollment and payment or, or collection of, of contributions. And the high rate of economic inactiveness or being not in the labor force is largely a gender issue on which emanates from traditional roles of women in the home. The high rate of uh, NEE, NEE among women and early marriages and perhaps teenage pregnancies are also areas for concern for social insurance um, coverage uh, expansion. The early dropout of older boys from school to seek for work um, or become unpaid workers in farms is, is an economic issue also that warrants appropriate uh, solutions. Next, please. So for our recommendations, expanding membership in social insurance is vital, particularly for the most vulnerable groups. The, the above mentioned factors such as short-term nature of jobs, coterminous work, seasonality, and fast turnover among workers or among, um, among other um, factors present difficulties for targeting workers in relevant interventions. Um, but people working for the government at least are relatively more feasible to, to locate and target. And um, so these are the volunteer health workers, the staff of local government units, um, the street sweepers, our uh, janitors, our tanods, um, and the short-term contract-based workers um, in the government. And so ensuring as many government workers as possible become and remain members of both GSIS or if not GSIS, um, even SSS and field health is a good start and is something that can be carried out, I think, in, in the short term. Enhancing the implementation or enforcement of current labor policies um, that ensure the inclusion, the inclusion of eligible private sector workers would benefit many male um, workers um, who are non-members because a large proportion of this group are workers in, in male um, in private establishments. Next, please. Okay, so interventions that seek to improve women's access to social protection must prioritize those in the agricultural sector, the self-employed, the unpaid family members, and the household workers. Informal workers may be reached through non-government organizations and the social enter entrepreneurs working with them. Also, relevant government agencies and local governments must partner uh, with these bodies for a more proactive promotion of social insurance uh, to these workers. NGOs, for instance, can be um, instrumental um, in facilitating access through information and education programs, referrals, and, and documentary assistance for, for women. Excuse me. For the unorganized groups, um, social protection is a good entry point for their organization. Um, such approach um, benefit comes from the fact that uh, social protection is, is crucial to these informal workers, um, the home base and the casual workers. Next, please. 
And um, yeah, further analysis must be carried out to understand the barriers of young women in, young women in entering the workforce. Um, for instance, reducing or efforts that reduce the incidence of teenage pregnancies is important in addressing huge gaps in the labor force participation. Also, effective interventions um, must be designed to address their educational and training needs. If an individual is not able to get um, the necessary training for work at an early age, it is likely that um, that, that person will encounter job-related problems in the future. In, in general, um, boosting the employability of, of both young men and women um, is essential to sustain efforts in enhancing access to social protection. Next, please. So if young girls and married women uh, alike are confined in their homes because of their traditional roles, there are opportunities in home-based work or enterprises that can take on as alternative sources of income. There are many women who are now engaging in, in online businesses, um, using online platforms and social media to market their products. So while the extent of their exposure in online work and businesses uh, is yet to be examined, um, it is crucial for the government to design approaches that will entice them to, to become members of, of the SSS and field health. And the partnership between the government and online platforms can be um, forged to encourage um, more entrepreneurs into, into social insurance. Next, please. Efforts that facilitate and improve um, their access to home-based income opportunities as well as relevant um, skills must therefore be, be implemented. Notably, there are young adults, um, both men and women, who are neither in education or employment with relatively high education. So it is important. So not all the me um, um, are, are, are without education or marami din sa kanila. So they also have, there are also those who are not in education nor employment with relatively high education. And it is very important to, to create an environment that encourages them to participate more actively um, in the economy. And impediments, administrative or otherwise, sorry for too many texts, but it's really important that I, I really provide all these recommendations. Impediments, uh, administrative or otherwise, toward expanding membership must be carefully examined uh, and addressed. Local governments can implement more active efforts for expanding social insurance coverage by installing perhaps one-stop shops that enable residents to obtain military requirements and enroll with the relevant agencies um, at the same venue um, and time. Other difficulties, such as in terms of, of, of payment or enrollment or collection of contribution, especially by members in remote areas, must also be examined and um, um, improved on. There are also opportunities that we found um, among paid family workers and employers in their own family operated business or farms. The proportion of SSS and field health members is low, but relatively higher than those um, among the unpaid workers and self-employed. And this suggests the need for improving awareness and enhancing people's perception and the benefits of membership in both schemes. It is also crucial for national and local governments uh, to conduct advocacy campaign for promoting awareness and need for social insurance and even partner with various organizations and platforms, including online venues, uh, in motivating people to be more uh, proactive with social insurance. And insurance providers, SSS and field health um, and others must also take a more active role um, in their information and education campaign, um, maybe um, take advantage of, of the platforms and social media, something like that. Because ordinary citizens must understand the importance of social um, social insurance. In the agricultural um, sector, for instance, income security can be improved if farmers are made more aware about the importance of agricultural or, or crop insurance in, in a country that is highly vulnerable to natural calamities. So I think there is a need to improve mindsets here in general um, about why um, social insurance is important. I think in these difficult times, having to face all these um, huge challenges um, that the pandemic brought us made us realize how important it is to have um, a buffer. And it is high time to change mindsets and it's a rare window of, of opportunity that uh, we all can take advantage of. Lastly, um, in, in a much broader sense, all efforts for achieving income security, um, enhancing agricultural productivity and offer 
income opportunities in the rural areas and facilitating innovative work schemes that are inclusive of women are all consistent with initiatives for improving access to social insurance. I think that ends my, my presentation. Thank you.